Hello, and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm James Fediplace, the director of IT for the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and I'm in the Stephen Ewell Friendly Atheist Studio in Free Thought Hall, which is the headquarters of FFRF in Madison, Wisconsin. On today's show, Adoption, Ground Zero for Religious Exemptions, we're honored to have with us two guests, Julie Cruza, who is the Director of Federal Policy at Family Equality, which advances legal and lived equality for LGBTQ families and for those who wish to form community, form them through building community, changing hearts and minds, and driving policy change. Their work to defend the rights of LGBTQ children and families engaging with the foster care system is extraordinary. Also with us is Ernesto Olivares, a young leader who experienced religious-based discrimination in foster care in Texas. He testified before Congress on this issue. A quick caveat, Ask an Atheist is open to all people of all beliefs, and you don't have to be an atheist to be on the show. I happen to identify as an atheist, but our guests may not. For more information on the critical topic we're discussing today, please follow Family Equality on Twitter at family underscore equality. Welcome, Julie and Ernesto. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. If you have questions for Julie or Ernesto, or for me, you can ask them in the Facebook comments or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. Yes, this show is called Ask an Atheist, but today we also have a question for you. Why do you think religious conservatives are making adoption and foster care the new cultural wedge issue? Put your answers on Facebook in the comments and we might read it on the air, assuming that it's family friendly. And Please remember, FFRF is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization. So not only do we happily accept your donations, we also do not and cannot take sides in partisan elections and don't necessarily endorse any such views that might be expressed here. So why is the director of IT hosting today? Well, not only did I work in the past for organizations that served foster and adoptive care systems, I'm also a former foster parent and an adoptive parent through Dane County Human Services here in Wisconsin. To be the best ally possible for children and youths placed with my family, I tried to educate myself about the needs and challenges of LGBTQ youths, as well as the multi-layered inequalities that lead to youths being placed out of their homes. Through that experience, I had opportunities to see firsthand how various systems treat youths and how resources for foster homes are woefully inadequate to help us be the best foster parents possible, and especially for LGBTQ youths in particular. The number of certified foster homes here in Dane County has always been lower than the number of youths who need foster homes. And now we're seeing this wave of anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ legislation and the rise of so-called religious freedom at the same time. Both factors effectively reduce the number of eligible foster homes when there's already a deficit in certified foster homes nationwide. Ernesto, in 2020, you testified before the House Committee on Oversight and Reform about your experiences. Uh, we have a clip to share. The foster care agency that I was placed through was a Christian agency. I believe my foster parents were good people with good intentions. They attended a Christian church. I am religious, but I am not a Christian. At first, I went with them to the Christian church out of curiosity, but as I got older, it became awkward and hurtful to hear that I would go to hell for being gay and that I wasn't normal. But if I didn't go, I might be made, of, made fun of or seen as weird and different. I was worried the other kids would think there was something wrong with me or suspect I was gay. So I never came out. Even though most people probably knew I was gay, when I saw people get bullied, it struck fear into me to be different. I wasn't wrong to fear coming out. LGBTQ plus and two-spirit youth are over twice as likely to report being treated poorly by the foster care system compared to non-LGBTQ youth. The thing that scared me the most is that I heard rumors that gay kids got sent to a special home, 24-hour surveillance with other youth who really had mental issues at special needs. If I came out and one of the other boys in the home didn't like it, 
Would I be sent there? What about my brother? Would I lose being with him too? My sisters and I went to the same high school. Would I not see them again until I was 18? There was too much to lose. My brother and sisters mean the world to me, and the thought of being separated from them killed me inside. I'd do anything to keep those relationships close and safe to me. It is unethical and outrageous to separate any siblings for identifying as LGBTQ. I remember one day we were getting ready to go on a family vacation, and I went to grab my bag, the big bright blue one they give you, to put all your things in when it's time to move placements. Someone had scratched out my name and written faggot in its place. I cried, and I kept it to myself until we got back from vacation. Eventually, I did tell my therapist what happened. I had asked her not to bring my foster parents into the room, and she decided to bring them in anyway. Even though I showed them the tag as proof, they denied that anyone in the house would ever do that, so nothing was ever done about that incident. I wonder if the agency serving me had been required to protect me from discrimination, regardless of religion, mine or the agency's, whether they would have been more proactive about preventing anti-gay bullying targeting me. Ernesto, how did a lack of protections combined with the religiosity affect you in the Texas foster care system? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, first of all. Thank you. For me, I think that the lack of support, um, it came from just the lack of understanding and knowledge in, and acknowledgement from the foster parents. There's not training, there's not, um, at least when I was in care, other LGBTQ identifying parents to understand what I was going through. Um, and for me, it was just difficult to express what I was feeling when I didn't feel safe, when I didn't feel comfortable speaking my truth. And when incidents like that happened or when people talked um, aggressively about LGBTQ people using different slurs, it hurt, it made it difficult um, to be who I was. And the people who are supposed to be surrounding me and protecting me and keeping me safe didn't support me um, or even try to stop the language from being used. And it made it difficult, you know, in growing up. Mm -hmm. How do you tell yourself, how do you process all those things? And um, my understanding from your testimony was that you were also placed in, it sounded like a group home. Is that is that correct? And if so, what kind of resources, if any, were available to you um, while you were there? It was a group home, but it's classified now. So it had um, 11 foster youth in there. Um, so there's 11 other foster boys um, placed in the home. There was two foster parents. And the only services that I got while I was there was having therapy sessions once a week until I was about a junior in high school. And then it went to once a month. There were no other services provided for me um, or there was no ever like talk, like if you identify as LGBTQ, here are some numbers or people you can call and have these conversations with. So um, for our listeners, um, my understanding is that there are requirements in terms of what is supposed to be posted in foster homes and group homes and things like that about um, uh, resources that are available uh, for, for the foster children and youths. Um, so that's a really important point that you make, that um, that resource wasn't made obvious to you, to you or clear to you. Um, another question I had, too, was about the, um, you don't have to talk details about therapy, but I'm just curious, from your perspective, were, were, was the therapy LGBTQ-informed, trauma-informed, or anything like that? No, it was not. Not ever. So uh, our listeners, if you have questions for Julie, Ernesto, or for me, um, you can ask them in the Facebook comments or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. Um, last week, uh, Representative Virginia Fox gave a speech on the House floor about religious liberty in adoption services. We're going to play a clip for you. Those on the left claim they're faith-based organizations 
that faith-based organizations must abandon their conscience and amend their employment practices or they should not have access to federal contracts for funds. It's a damning ultimatum. Imagine how many faith-based organizations would be forced to close their doors because of this. Madam Speaker, this coordinated campaign is being carried out by the left and it's guided by the assumption that a radical progressive dogma is more legitimate than religious beliefs. Mm. Ernesto, how does that relate to your experiences? Um, for me, it relates that continuously the conversation is always pushed to how do we support foster parents, how do we support adoptive parents, and a lot of the times advocating um, for the, since I was 15, you hear these conversations over and over again where the children are not the first priority. It's how do we protect our agencies, how do we protect our parents, and unfortunately, um, in my case here in South Texas, a lot of our agencies are religious-based, and so when you talk about the state being our parent, the person who's supposed to protect us, people who identify as myself as LGBTQ or Two-Spirit lack those parents who can support us and view and understand what we are going through. And for her to say that we will lose those homes, um, it's kind of harmful for the entire system. Um, the John Lewis Every Child Deserves Family Act bars discrimination on religious and against LGBTQ people. And I think that's where I think um, for me, a lot of people are missing the view. We are not trying to say, take religion out of foster care. We're just saying be inclusive to everyone. And if you are trying to open up your agency to people so that kids can have a loving home, then why not do it for everyone? Because LGBTQ people are twice as likely to open up their homes um, for foster care or adoption. And I think that's important for people to know. Thank you. And when you, when you talk about inclusion, um, I think of the sense of inclusion is feeling like you belong somewhere, having a sense of belonging. Um, what would you say to uh, foster homes or potential foster homes to provide a more inclusive environment for youths who are LGBTQ? Yeah, I would just say keep your mind open to keep your heart open and just remember that kids who are in the foster care system have already gone through multiple traumas that ended up them in, that, end, that ended them into the system. And keep that in mind that your personal views are important. However, these kids need love and care. They need somewhere safe, someone to protect them. And sometimes it's remember that, listen, above all else, love one another. And these kids need love. Thank you, that's beautiful. Um, Julie, what would you say to the opposition who are arguing that if you prohibit discrimination, it will force religious organizations to close their doors and reduce the number of eligible foster placements? Yeah, so um, I'm just gonna go back and start with a little bit of history. Uh, okay. You know, the child welfare system originally 400 years ago in this country generally was faith-based you know there were catholic orphanages protestant orphanages jewish orphanages often segregated by faith and there is that history of faith-based providers being engaged in the system but we're not living 400 years ago we're living now and now there are uh you know standards set by the child welfare league of america by the national association of social workers by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, by the AMA, the American Association of Pediatrics, the American Psychiatric Association. So you can't just open an agency and do whatever you want. And some agencies um, have had to make a journey, uh, some faith-based agencies have had to make a journey to LGBTQ acceptance, which is critical, uh, because one in three foster youth identify as LGBTQ and have much worse outcomes in care. Um, Ernesto pointed to the fact that LGBTQ foster youth report twice the rate of mistreatment in care. They have much higher rates of hospitalization for emotional reasons, homelessness, being trafficked, 
um, uh, being placed in group homes for long periods of time, not being placed in foster homes, being shuttled from placement to placement, really, um, as Ernesto pointed out, compiling trauma onto the trauma they've already experienced. So our system is failing these youth. And the cardinal rule of child welfare, by law, is that you must act in the best interest of the child. So when you're acting in the best interest of the agency and not the child, you're not following the law. And I would just say that there are faith-based providers who have made this journey. And the largest evangelical faith-based provider in the country, Bethany Christian Services, um, they have services in 35 states. Uh, just this last year, they uh, made a commitment and a new policy to not discriminate against LGBTQ children or foster parents. And I think every agency can make that journey. Um, but as Ernesto pointed out, foster children are, are wards of the state. They're children of the state and the state's obligations towards those children. Julie, are you able to share um, any statistics that you've been able to gather uh, with your organization, Family Equality, um, uh, uh, just to provide a little bit more context again about um, the additional challenges for the LGBTQ youths who are uh, in out-of-home placements through the foster care system? Yeah, and we have a lot of that information um, on the Every Child Deserves a Family campaign website, which is everychilddeservesafamily.com, as well as many stories of other young leaders in addition to Ernesto's. Um, and you can also go for more information to familyequality.org. Um, but, you know, there have been recent studies in Ohio, New York, uh, Los Angeles, um, and every study points to really poor outcomes for LGBTQ foster youth. And there's really a recognition in the field um, among the, you know, the child welfare associations that we're not going to fix the child welfare system if you have such atrocious outcomes for one in three of the youth in care. Um, so it's, it's a challenge that, um, you know, our foster care system needs to address and that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services needs to address and, um, you know, every foster care agency and, um, and every uh, state agency and tribal agency needs to address. And you also mentioned earlier um, about the journey that some agencies have yet to go through. Um, is that part of what your organization, Family Equality, does, is reach out to these agencies and um, help them uh, go down a path of more inclusion? We certainly work with other um, providers, like I said, the largest associations of, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of social workers, uh, medical providers, and uh, connect them to resources and training that exist. Um, but we think that every agency should be required to have training around LGBTQ cultural competency, which is why we also strongly support the John Lewis Every Child Deserves a Family Act. Uh, this bill that was written by, you know, the great civil rights icon, John Lewis, who really saw the right of children to a family and to an affirming supportive family that supports their identity um, as a civil rights issue that needed to be addressed. Um, and when he and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand wrote that bill, they really said, you know, the system is failing our children and families so badly that we really need to uh, fundamentally address these failures. And so um, in addition to barring discrimination in foster care and adoption based on religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status, um, I would note that there already is a bar on discrimination based on race, color, and national origin due to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, in addition to that, uh, the bill stands up a resource center for LGBTQ foster youth at HHS to do the research and figure out how can we get to better outcomes for these youth and then train everyone touched by the system um, in, in that. Um, it bars conversion therapy for foster youth, which happens way too often, and is, that's a you know, medically discredited form, really, of child abuse, um, in my opinion. And um, it uh, requires data collection on sexual orientation and gender identity for foster parents and youth so that states can measure their own outcomes and see how they're doing. Uh, every study in every location we've seen has shown that um, agencies are failing our children, but you can't really hold states and tribes and agencies accountable unless you have the data to say, 
you know, Missouri's doing great. People should pick up Missouri's practices. You know, Kansas, not so good. Uh, we don't even have the data for that. Um, and, um, and the bill also requires that every foster parent and every worker coming into contact with a child has to have training on um, affirming the complex social identity of a child. Uh, including their race, color, national origin, religion, spirituality, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, ability. Um, and that's critical because we know the system is greatly failing uh, black youth, tribal youth, and other foster youth of color. So this is the way this bill is not just uh, addressing a slice of the problem, but really getting at the core of the foster care problem, which is we need to affirm every child in care and center foster care um, uh, around their needs and address the disparate outcomes that children of color and LGBTQ and two-spirit youth are facing. Thank you, Julie. Um, how close were we during the Trump administration to having broad religious exemptions in adoption and foster care and in other areas, in your opinion? Um, not only were we close, we were there. And unfortunately, mm. um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has not yet acted to undo uh, all of the harmful actions of the Trump administration. They've undone some key harms, and uh, they've uh, put out some protections for LGBTQ foster youth, but some of those harmful policies are still in place. And unfortunately, uh, under the at the end of the Obama administration, uh, there was a— there was a rule that HHS put forward um, to bar discrimination based on religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and foster care. And that regulation was effect, that in effect, that was the law. And in November of 2019, um, President Trump uh, and his Department of Health and Human Services issued a notification and non-enforcement that they were no longer going to enforce that rule. And that has not been undone by Secretary a Azar and HHS. Um, and as a matter of fact, Family Quality sued over that rule, Family Quality v. Azar, that was recently dismissed in court uh, due to lack of standing. So uh, we're pretty frustrated with this situation and hope they act quickly um, to reinstate those non-discrimination protections. And then when we are hear stories from children and families facing discrimination in foster care, they could file complaints with the HHS Office of Civil Rights. But right now, there's no basis to do that. Um, and that's really unfortunate. Uh, President Biden, on his first day in office, issued an executive order directing agency heads to ensure um, equity and non-discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation, gender identity, in every federal program. And um, HHS is moving forward on this in health care, um, and again, has provided some protections, but we want um, reinstatement of full non-discrimination protections. And then for children and families to know uh, when I'm being discriminated against, um, who can I call, where can I go, and who will have my back? Um, and that's not in place now, and that's really tragic, especially when you look at situations in Texas where the governor instated um, a new policy that affirming your transgender children and providing them with necessary, uh, medically necessary care uh, could lead to accusations of child abuse and having your children removed from your home. And luckily, that policy has been stayed in court thanks to litigation led by the ACLU and Lambda Legal. Um, but families are very afraid. And um, in response to that, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services put out an information memorandum explaining that gender-affirming care is not child abuse, that affirming your transgender child is not child abuse, and that agencies should uh, act to protect LGBTQ foster youth. And we are greatly appreciative of that. In addition, the Trump administration had issued a waiver to South Carolina and Texas to allow agencies in those locations to discriminate. And the U.S. Department of, Ag uh, of Health and Human Services revoked those waivers. Um, so there's been steps in the right direction, but what we want to see is comprehensive non-discrimination policy. Um, and Secretary uh, Becerra could uh, revoke the notification of non-enforcement with the stroke of a pen, and we hope he chooses to do so. 
So it sounds like we also, though, have, uh, in, in addition to the policies left over from the Trump administration, there are also um, these religious-based exemptions that are on the horizon, um, uh, as you mentioned, um, policy changes in Texas. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, Ernesto, your, your thoughts on this. Um, if these policies are not um, um, taken away, if these exemptions that are on the horizon go through, um, how would that have affected individuals or will affect individuals like yourself um, that are in the foster care system? Yeah, so I think a lot of these um waivers that were issued by the Trump administration would only do harm to foster youth as they continue to discriminate against potential foster parents, current foster parents, and adoptive parents, and foster youth. Julie mentioned conversion therapy and how it's still legal here in the state of Texas and how we don't, I don't see it either as, you know, a safe practice for youth. Um, but I think that a lot of these religious-based policies that are in place are only harming, you know, the 20%, 25%, which is, once again, unclear because they're not keeping data on LGBTQ youth. Um, I think it's only harming them because we, we don't know exactly what we need to do. And the more that you keep pushing these policies of protecting foster parents agencies um, based on religious value, you start to lose what are we, what are we doing for the child? And um, to answer your second question, um, which is, do I want to be a foster parent? At some point, I do want to be a foster parent. I even want to go to uh, pass that, go even further and adopt. And I think it just concerns me um, at this point um, with, you know, the governor passing, um, you know, these harmful bills recently. How difficult or how hard is it going to be for me to to get through that process here in the state of Texas. Um, and I think that's my biggest concern. How hard am I gonna have to fight? How long is this gonna take? And how much you know, of my finances is it gonna you know, pull away from me? Do I decide to be a foster parent? And I think, and so at the end of it, it's a complicated answer. Yes, I do wanna be a foster parent. I wanna adopt, um, but how many hurdles am I gonna continue having to jump over to, to make that happen? Right. Um, again, today's topic on Ask an Atheist is adoption um, ground zero. Um, I am your host, uh, James Fetaplace. I'm the director of IT at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. So um, we are going to um, move uh, along to uh, today's questions. Um, I am going to try to get some updated questions for you, and then uh, we will... Um, um, we will continue our conversation. Uh, right now, I'm not able to uh, see the questions, um, so um, uh, I am, uh, I'm also technically challenged. So, um, Julie, I'm just gonna uh, put a question back to you. Um, you, were, you were mentioning um, uh, what, it, what it's like for, um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a national level, um, in terms of the statistics for uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQ youths that are in the foster care system and uh, the poor outcomes um, that we've been seeing. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, how those outcomes are, are measured and maybe even why we're seeing such dramatic differences for uh, LGBTQ youths that are in the, the foster care system? Yeah, so um, I, first of all, I want to say that there are many faith-based agencies um, that are living their faith and affirming every child's identity and are called to do that by their faith, that their faith calls them to love every child as a perfect being um, exactly as they are. Uh, but there are other faith-based agencies um, that discriminate, for example, against uh, religious minority parents or secular parents or um, LGBTQ parents. And we saw a case recently in Tennessee that got a lot of attention, the Rutan Ram family, uh, a heterosexual Jewish couple that wanted to foster um, 
uh, uh, young, uh, child looking for a family from Florida, and they were turned away by their Tennessee agency from doing so. Um, they did end up fostering another child, but what we don't know is what about that child in Florida who was seeking a family? Did that child find a family? And we documented in our amicus brief uh, before the Supreme Court on a case covering this issue um, the stories of LGBTQ parents that were turned away from fostering and adopting. And um, one family, for example, one lesbian family in Michigan who had hoped to uh, foster a child who was listed as seeking an adoptive family and was turned away because they were lesbians. And they have gone back every year since then for five subsequent years and seen that that child is still listed as seeking a family. And what they say is they just hope that that child knows that there was a family out there that wanted him. Um, and that's the tragedy is that this is harming real children. Um, and as Ernesto pointed out, LGBTQ uh, adults are twice as likely to foster um, and adopt than other adults. And um, so when you have agencies that turn away prospective parents, it's it's really uh, we're mixing up the priorities. Um, the uh, priority should be to get as many homes, qualified homes for children as possible, not to accommodate the personal beliefs of agencies. Um, and sorry, I'm forgetting the rest of your question. No, that's all right. That's right. Um, and actually, I do have um, a question that has been submitted to us. Um, and today's question is from Michelle Hawkins. Um, and first, I'm going to direct this question to Ernesto and then back to you, Julie. Um, what do you think is the most important thing a person can know before becoming a foster parent or adopting? Yeah, um, I think what's important, I'm going to take this to a, from my childhood uh, perspective, is that um, we are depressed, we are traumatized, and patience is key. Um, we've been through so much going into the system that we need parents to understand um, that it's going to take some time to build that trust and that comfort with you, and that you need to give us time to heal so that we can show you who we are as a child um, because the quickest issue to fix what we're going through is to put us on medication. Um, and you see that, and that's a completely different topic that we won't get into right now, um, but it's prescriptive medication to deal with the trauma that we are going through. You give that child time to recover and to heal, get them the proper attention therapy that they need so that they can be you know, that, that child that they were before they got taken from their family. Thank you. And I do want to make a note, too, when you when you talk about trauma, um, and especially if those of you who are listening are curious about becoming a foster or, or adoptive parent, is trauma-informed parenting, um, training, learning opportunities um, are absolutely critical. Because as has been pointed out numerous times now, that if you're a child or a youth in the foster care system, you have experienced trauma. And in some cases, complex kinds of trauma that when you're trying to be a parent, you, um, you can't parent in the same way that you would for your own you know, family, for your own birth children. Um, uh, when, when a child has trauma, it's, it's, it's uh, a different approaches are necessary. So going into that without understanding uh, the critical importance of understanding trauma and how to be a trauma-informed parent, um, that, that is just, from my experience, um, absolutely um, a requirement. Um, and unfortunately, to my knowledge, it is not a requirement um, at this time for, for uh, foster and adoptive families to, to learn about that. Julie, I would also like to pose that same question to you. What do you think is the most important thing that um, um, a potential foster and adoptive family should know? Um, well, uh, in addition to uh, concurring with everything Ernesto would say, was saying, um, because there are so many LGBTQ children in the foster care system, parents need to be trained on how to support their foster children if they come out. And let's remember that there are kids coming out as nope. um, queer, um, coming out as trans, um, as young as four or five, six years old, um, even younger. And so you, every foster parent needs to be prepared for that. 
Um, and New York City, for example, and other uh, areas train every foster parent on how to affirm their LGBTQ children. That said, New York City recently came out with a study about how um, LGBTQ children in their system also have really poor outcomes. And that's why we want this resource center stood up nationally to help every state, every tribe, every agency, including those that are trying really hard to do well by their children, um, to get the resources they need and the training they need and the research they need to be able to have better outcomes. I think there's a will, um, but every, uh, every study has shown that these children are being failed. So we need to transform the system and really provide parents with the resources and support um, and the children with the support they need um, to address uh, affirming their children's identity. And uh, identity, uh, let's say you have a religious family and um, an atheist child, um, how to affirm that child's identity, or uh, a Christian family and a Muslim child, how to affirm that child's identity. So um, this is uh, something that's just urgently, urgently needed. Um, and I would point out that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has been providing grants and even did under the Trump administration to agencies um, on how to improve outcomes for LGBTQ youth. And there's been some really groundbreaking work. Um, uh, one key reason that so many LGBTQ children are in the foster care system is that they're rejected by their families of origin. And so uh, there's some family acceptance programs that are really groundbreaking, that really lean into religion and really lean into culture and say, how can we help families of origin um, accept their kids, because the best thing for a kid is to be with their family of origin if that's a safe place for them to be. Um, and other agencies have found LGBTQ relatives to care for LGBTQ children. So these programs need to be um, researched and expanded and uh, disseminated uh, nationwide, because there, there are solutions and we can solve this, but um, it's just not happening on the scale it needs to happen. And for, for our listeners, um, I, for either you, Ernesto, or Julie, uh, what are things that they can do to to help um, uh, support uh, the actions of the Family Center? Well, I encourage everyone to go to familyequality.org and to go to our Action Center and send an email. It's a really easy thing to do. Um, and tell your members of Congress, your senators and uh, representatives to support the John Lewis Every Child Deserves a Family Act. We already have 200 co-sponsors in the House and I believe nearly 40 in the Senate. Um, we're still building support and we expect that bill to move in the House this year. Um, and just that education of your policymakers um, that this matters uh, is, is really important for them to hear from their constituents that these issues are important. And then um, I would say uh, support your local um, uh, foster care program. If, if you don't have the capacity to be a foster parent, volunteer, um, provide resources, provide support. You know, uh, children in foster care need mentors. They need connections to adults who will affirm them. So um, there's plenty you can do uh, both nationally and at the local level. And I'll let Ernesto add anything to that that he has. Yeah, no, really took it right out of my mouth. I was, the big one is get involved locally. Um, reach out to your U.S. representatives and senators and let them know about the John Lewis Every Child Deserves the Family Act. Um, but like Julie said, get involved in your community. Get to a community center. Get to a foster care agency and see how you can help out if you do not want to foster parent or adopt. But if you are interested, the first step is to walk in. Julie Cruza, Ernesto Alvarez, thank you so much for joining us today about this critical topic. And I hope to discuss this with you again in the future and keep us, keep us posted on your efforts. Thank you. And thank you to the Freedom From Religion Foundation for really stepping up and uh, advocating for foster youth. Uh, we really appreciate uh, those, that support and that advocacy. Yes, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And that concludes Ask an Atheist for this week. Thank you for joining us. Uh, be sure to check out FFRF's broadcast TV program, Free Thought Matters. 
This week, Dan and Annie Laurie will interview West Virginia high school student Max Nybert, who led a walkout to protest a minister holding a revival service in his school during the school day. Here's a preview. Our uh, non-religious folks themselves were sending me pictures and videos of uh, the revival that was happening in the auditorium, saying, you know, you need to, to check this out because I'm not religious. And I told my teacher I wanted to leave, and they said I couldn't. So uh, just by talking with them, you know, and doing some of my own research, I learned eventually uh, that a, a Christian revivalist sermon was held by Reverend Nick Walker in the auditorium at Huntington High School during the school day, and that multiple students and multiple classrooms of students uh, asked to leave and were told that that was not allowed. Matters on TV stations around the U.S. on Sunday mornings or on FFRF's YouTube and Facebook channels. And you should also listen to Free Thought Radio, FFRF's weekly radio show and podcast, ffrf.org radio. This week, Dan Barker and Annie Laurie, Laurie Gaylor speaking to several of our FFRF attorneys with updates on ongoing legal actions around the country. If you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. See you next time on FFRF's Ask an Atheist.